So, I am going to read you a list of accomplishments, and I want you to try to guess who this is. Okay. This woman started the first juvenile court in the United States. Huh. She joined minors in a strike against John D. Rockefeller Jr. after a deadly standoff with Rockefeller's private army. Oh. She started the first animal welfare society. Really? She ran for Senate twice. Hmm. She was an ambulance driver in World War One. Have any guesses? No, not a clue. I feel like I've never heard of any of those things. You have heard of this person. Huh. And her name is Margaret Brown. And I haven't heard of that person. I have heard about her. The name that you know her by is the unsinkable Molly Brown. Oh, from the musical. From the musical. <laughs> from Titanic. <laughs> From all of these things. So, some of our listeners may say, yes, I've heard of Molly Brown. I know all about Molly Brown. Yeah, I've seen the show. Yeah, you know everything there is to know about mm -hmm. Molly Brown. None of that is true. But she's like the American Pygmalion. She's my fair lady in America. And she has this great story. It's perfect, and why are we going to debunk it? Yeah. Because her real life is so much better than the myths about her. And I don't understand why we rewrote a life that is amazing on its own. Huh. So today we're going to meet the real Molly Brown. Awesome. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. The very first thing that you need to know about Molly Brown is that her name is not Molly Brown. <laughs> she was never named Molly Brown. You mean not even a nickname? Not even a nickname. Her name was Margaret. She was called Maggie. Not Molly. Not Molly. Never not even Molly. as a kid. Molly's never her name. So how did she get the name Molly then? Funny you should ask. Her name is not Molly Brown. Her f she was always called Margaret or Maggie when she was alive. That name actually came out right after her death in 1932. There was a book that came out by Jean Fowler called Timberline. And in that book, it has tons of Denver socialites in it, but he completely made up her life. Being swept up in a tornado, being born in a river, and Mark Twain saved her. And <laughs> like all these stories that eventually that was taken into the musical in the 1960s, right. The Unsinkable Molly Brown. And in that musical, Meredith Wilson, who wrote the lyrics, found it way too hard to sing Margaret. So he switched her name to Molly. Oh. And so ever since then, she's been known as Molly. <laughs> so ever since the moment when he names her Molly Brown, she becomes Molly Brown forevermore. And also rewrote her entire life story. But I bet she's pissed. She might be pissed, but she might be kind of happy because even as completely wrong as the mythology about her life is, they also made it possible to save her house. It's right in the middle of downtown Denver, and it was slated to be torn down to make a parking lot. Oh, wow. In the 70s. That recognition partially because of that name helped actually save her house. The neighborhood that we're in here is called Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. And back in the late 1890s, this was where all the wealthy people were coming. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine this block, for those of you who have ever been to Denver, there were only four houses just like this house on this block. But over the years, of course, there's urban development and the wrecking ball was coming for it. And that musical coming out in the 60s was huge for preservation. Wow. Thankfully, there were a group of citizens here who thought her story and her legacy here in Denver was too important to destroy. Um, and of course, that musical helped with the name recognition. So people were more than welcome to say, yeah, let's do this. Let's save the house. And they did. Um, we actually opened up for our first tour in March of 1971. That's really interesting. But I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, who is this that we're listening to? Oh, <laughs> sorry. This is Jamie Melissa Wilms. She is the education director and outreach coordinator at the Molly Brown House Museum. Okay, cool. So, yeah, in a weird way, you know, Meredith Wilson's musical cemented her legacy in history while also at the same time destroying her legacy and, mm -hmm. and destroying the real life that she lived. So that's one of the main focuses of the Molly Brown Museum is to try to teach people her real legacy and why we really should be remember her, even if this fake story is why we cared enough to save her house. Yeah. Maybe you had to tell a woman's story that way Yeah, back then to get people to like her or care, mm -hmm. but now we don't need those same kind of tropes. We can... Yeah tell the story a different way now. Now we tell it our way. Right. And it's interesting because I think we've built a trope around her story. I mean, if you look at 
the Clampets, right? Or to catch a thief, the uneducated country bumpkin who suddenly comes into money through oil or gold or something, and then is lovable but ridiculous when they hit society. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've made this story around her story that never really existed. Mm -hmm. um, and that we really want her to be the reject because maybe we, that's how we see ourselves. Yeah. I think the reason we like her story is because we think it's this quintessential story of the uneducated poor girl who stumbles into wealth. And none of that is true. She was actually extremely well-educated. She was very poor. She grew up very poor, the child of Irish immigrants in Missouri. But her parents were extremely focused on education. So as a poor Irish immigrant girl in Missouri, she got an eighth grade education, which is almost unheard of. Her dad was very active in the Underground Railroad. Oh. And her mom was in the Irish Resistance. What, like the Irish Resistance in Ireland? In America. Like oh. Like they, I guess the Irish Americans were apparently the fiercest wow. fighters. And even the first and second generation Irish were super extra Irish. Oh. Really dedicated. She grew up with this very like social justice mindset of you use what you have to help people. And so even though they were extremely poor, they were constantly looking outward, trying to help the people around them. She had five brothers and sisters. They were very poor. They lived in a very small house right in Hannibal. But education was very important to Margaret's mother. So her and all of her siblings all had an eighth grade education. But when she was done with eighth grade, she did something that I would never want to do. She worked in a tobacco factory, rolling mm. tobacco. Ooh, does not sound like fun. But at that point, she had to do anything to help her family. So when she was 18 years old, though, she was still not a married woman. You're expected to be married around 16 or 17. Mm. So glad that has changed. Yes. <laughs> So, with no prospects in Hannibal, her brother Danny was actually already living out here in Leadville. He sent her money for a train ticket. Hmm. So, when she arrived, the local parish was having a garden party. And across the lawn, J.J. Brown and Margaret saw each other. And it wasn't love at first sight. Um, it took a little bit for him to woo her, but actually only three months. So they got married three months later. She was 19, he was 32, uh, which may seem like a big age difference, but 13 years was not uncommon at that point in time because mm. he had a job, he had a home, he was ready for family. Mm. Uh, he was not a rich man when they met. Uh, it wouldn't be until 1893 when he found the largest vein of gold in North America, in Leadville, that they became millionaires. She talked about really intending to marry wealthy mm -hmm. and then falling in love and going, okay, I guess I will marry for love. Yeah. He was a mining engineer, right? He was. So he wasn't poor. He wasn't rich. He was somewhere there in the middle. Yeah. Um, her whole intention with marrying rich was that she could help her family mm -hmm. because she saw her parents struggle as those poor Irish immigrants. Right. As a lot of immigrants come to this country, they don't have a lot. So mm -hmm. she wanted to make sure she could give back to her parents. I think it was very fortunate that JJ did find that vein of gold because yeah. uh, she was one of those women that she just didn't become rich and just sat behind and let everybody do work for her. Mm -hmm. She was one that used her money for good. She decides I'm going to marry a rich man so that I can take care of my family. How does a poor girl decide just I'm going to marry a rich right. man? That I mean, seems again, very self bold. The confidence yeah. that this woman has <laughs> exactly. is really amazing. <laughs> But it is a gold town. Like, you can probably go find someone in this gold camp who's made a lot of money. Was, so, she, a, was she known to be especially pretty or anything? She like was, did, was. She was she, handsome. She was a, a fine-looking woman is the way people talk about her. And she looks, even in the young pictures, she's very self-assured. You can tell she was a girl who knew what she wanted and was going to go get it. Um, and again, I think the education and the confidence to know, like, I am already ahead of the game. I am way more well-educated than most of the men in this town. So she arrives intent on the plan to marry a rich man. And across the crowd, she sees JJ. Love must win. And they get married. It's his job to keep the mine safe and up. And he is a really, really hard worker. In 1893, the government actually issued the Sherman Silver Repeal Act, which basically switched the U.S. backing of money from silver to gold, and it caused a silver crash. Mm -hmm. So people were looking for new ways to make money. JJ being the mining engineer that he was, he was always trying to find new ways to hold up those mine walls. 
because that was a huge problem for people up in Leadville. So he found a new way using hay bales hmm. to hold up those mine walls so that they really? would stop collapsing. While he was doing this, he actually found the largest vein of gold in North America at the time. And because of his hard work, I mean, this wasn't like an overnight thing where he figured out this new technique. It took quite some time to hmm. develop it. But once he found that vein of gold, he received a seat on the board of the company. They received shares in the company itself. So because of JJ working on this new technique and finding that vein, they became rich. So that's not dumb luck at it's all. It's not dumb luck. It's hard work. Yeah. It is luck. I mean, it's luck that he found it, but it's luck that happened only because he worked extremely hard and was very good at his job. Mm -hmm. So as soon as he becomes wealthy, she's like, we're out of here. They're in Leadville. Leadville is awful. I want to be out of here. So they move to Denver and they buy this beautiful house for $30,000 at the time, which now would be $800,000. So it's not, it, it was a lot of money, but- it was never, it's not a huge mansion. It's a very large, beautiful house. And then the trope goes, she moves in and she's rejected by society. And it's just not true. There, first of all, it's Denver. It's not New York. There isn't society. Huh. There's gold miners. So she is pretty quickly part of everything, but she is also not interested in society. She's not interested in ladies' pursuits, and she threw lots of big parties to raise money for things, but she wants to do stuff. She wants to fix the world. She worked with a very controversial judge. His name was Judge Ben Lindsay to form the first juvenile justice system. Because she saw children here in Denver, they were getting in trouble. They were getting arrested. They didn't have good places to go. So she made sure that they weren't tried as adults or sat in a jail cell with adults. They were tried as children, but also given that chance to go to a workhouse, mm -hmm. learn new skills. So what she worked on here with Judge Ben Lindsay became a model for other cities, including Chicago. So she and this judge create the first juvenile justice court in the United States. How, Out of their heads. Yeah. How could they do that? Just through sheer force of will, it sounds like, forced all of the parties to agree that, yeah, there should be a different way. And they create a completely new court where instead of being charged as adults, they're charged as children. And instead of going to prisons or jails, they are sent to workhouses or to reform programs or to, that she also started. And when I say she started them, I don't mean she like gave them money. I mean, she does the work and starts this completely new way of treating children, which at the time is crazy. Why would you ever treat children differently? And she just decided hmm. children are not adults and we can fix these problems instead of just throwing them away forever. Yeah. And they did. She helped form Denver's first animal shelter, the Denver Dumb Friends League. She donated enough money to keep the lights on for the first couple of years. I mean, it's still um, helping save dogs and cats. And those are just a few things she did locally. She also ran for Senate. Yes, I love that. This, this is my one of my favorite stories because she ran three times. She never won. Mm -hmm. But her last time was in 1914. Did we have the right to vote? No, yet? yeah, no. she's running for Senate before Four. she's allowed to vote. Right. Unfortunately, though, in 1914, she had to pull out of the race because World War One was starting. Mm -hmm. And her sister married a German aristocrat. So it's not good to be in politics. And right. Like, German in your family. Exactly. So instead, she set her sights on France, which was, she considered her second home. She headed over there and she actually drove in one of the first mobilized ambulance corps. And when she returned to the state, she actually helped translate the works of Mark Twain into Braille. She wanted to do something to help soldiers who came home. A lot of soldiers in World War I lost their eyesight. So Margaret, being from Hannibal, Missouri, uh, we also know Mark Twain is from right. there, even though they never met. Uh, she had his works translated into Braille. And I don't know how much of Braille she actually learned, but mm -hmm. she did teach them some basics so they could learn to read using Braille. And this is one of the things I love about her. I think that we often think about sort of society women philanthropists as mm -hmm. being very superficial and or self-centered. And she was just such a hands-on kind of community labor that you wouldn't associate with a high society woman. She's what I like to call the down and dirty charity yes. woman. Because she, like you said, she was not one to just throw big parties and here's all my money. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she did throw parties to raise <laughs> money, of course, but she was on the front lines of Ludlow. A lot of people don't know about what's called the Ludlow Massacre. Um, it was a small mining town just outside of Trinidad in southern Colorado, mm -hmm. and it was what you call a company town. So the company had complete control. They told you where to live. They told you where to shop. They told you all of your hours, and it wasn't good working conditions. People were getting sick. So the workers went on 
strike. And because of that, they were forced out of the homes that the company owned and lived in Tent City. So the company sent in the National Guard. And we don't know who shot first. We will never know that. But they started shooting and they actually burned down Tent City. And what happened was, unfortunately, about 14 women and children died that day. And Margaret, always knowing her roots, like she was in that mining camp, she saw what it was like for those workers. She decided that she was going to take action and go down to Ludlow. She stood on the picket lines right next to these miners, along with another woman, Mother Jones, which a lot more people know about her. She stood in those picket lines and she actually went up against the head of the company. She went up against John D. Rockefeller Jr. (laughs) and basically said, hey, let's let's make some things change. And it worked. I don't know how she did it, but what happened at Ludlow actually spread across the country to other mining camps Mm. and workers' rights changed because of it. Her husband owns mines, like their management, but she is so appalled by what's going on that she goes down there to march on the picket line with the miners. He bowed to the power of Margaret Brown and they all got their jobs back. What was he bowing to? Like, was it like this powerful society woman who... She wasn't really... She was very well known in Denver and we don't really get the sense that she was extremely well known elsewhere. People knew who she was and especially after Titanic. She was a well-known figure but she kept undercutting her own power Mm -hmm. and her own notoriety. So it seems like she was just a force to be reckoned with and if you got in the room with this woman you were losing. Hmm. She did so much with the way that she was known in society, but she was always really, really careful to decenter herself. She did not want it to be about her. And she gave huge amounts of her money to all of these charitable projects. So was she, I mean, I'm kind of envisioning her like the reigning monarch of Denver. Was she that influential? She, and-, and she wasn't. And that's, I think that she could have been if she wanted to. Mm. But she did not want the spotlight when she's on the front lines of the mine strike. We have no pictures of her. There are pictures of Mother Jones down there. Mm. The press would complain that as soon as the camera showed up, she would disappear. Back then, it was a little easier for her to step out of the spotlight because you didn't have CNN or Fox News chasing her down or following her, interviewing her. Uh, She made sure that if there was cameras there, she avoided them. We have no pictures of her on Carpathia. We have none at Ludlow. We have none of her working with Judge Ben Lindsay mm. or even driving those ambulances in France. Right. I would have loved to have seen a photo of her behind the wheel. But she, like I said, wanted to make sure that what she was doing became more of the focus than her. And I don't know if her same efforts were done today and she had a microphone in her face, how she would react. I find that really interesting in terms of the way that we talk about that now, because we we often hear criticism of celebrities who who are espousing a cause and it sometimes turns out to be more about them. I think it's a cheap and easy criticism to make of celebrities. You're just doing this because you want attention, but that it is really hard to do that. It's hard to use a platform to bring attention to something and yet remove the focus from yourself. And it sounds like she was really successful at doing that, or at least tried really, really hard to, to do that. I think she was, and we're also in a different time now too. Mm -hmm. So we have 24-7 media, Mm -hmm. where if Shia LaBeouf blows his nose wrong, we know about (laughs) it. So she actually started to use the media to her advantage. There was a gossip columnist here in Denver called Polly Pry, and she started writing articles about Margaret. Well, they became friends Mm -hmm. and worked with Polly to kind of change the attitude of those articles. So they would kind of talk more about her causes and what she was doing instead of the gossip that Polly was doing before. So she worked to make sure that the media at the time, the newspapers, were on her side. Um, And there was scandal in her marriage with JJ, but she worked beyond that. She didn't let that stop her. She found a way to use the newspapers to her advantage. There were some really embarrassing things. Her husband was sued for alienation of affection by another man. So he was having an affair with a married woman and it hit the press and it was totally embarrassing. And they did separate. She and her husband did separate at that point. They stayed friends and they were friendly, but they never reconciled. She was Catholic, so they never divorced. But she really hated having those kind of things in the press. And so, again, that pattern of, all right, how can I solve this? And just going in and saying, you know what? Hey, I'll feed you these stories Hmm. so that she could make the press do what she wanted without having to exert influence in any sort of way that she might feel sketchy about. Turn her enemies into her allies. Yeah.
So the myth of Molly Brown, of course, is mostly from the musical, but there's all of these pieces to it. There's the story that she fell out of, fell into the Mississippi River as a child and was fished out and saved by Mark Twain. And there's a story that she was a barmaid in Denver, or sometimes a barmaid in Denver, which is in the musical, of course, she's the belly up to the bar song. And she was this completely rough, embarrassingly gauche kind of woman who lands in the Denver scene and doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And I think we really like that story. We seem to really be drawn to that that archetype of rags to riches, the embarrassing entree into society that then wins society over with our good heart. Yeah, with our authentic, right, rough ways. And in fact, she seems to have slid in pretty smoothly. She arrived on the scene with her agenda of what she wanted to accomplish. She um, may or may not have been well regarded by the other society women. She really didn't care. She just knew what she wanted to do. And she was in enough that everyone wanted to be invited to her events because they were a big deal. They were viewed as serious minded. Oh. She didn't really care about being popular. She just wanted to be effective. And she was popular enough to be effective. That's all that mattered to her. I think you can see her values, especially in the moment when they become wealthy. They move to Denver. They move to this very nice but not extravagant home. And the very first thing she does is start engaging teachers. And she also allows slash invites slash maybe insists that all of the members of her household take these classes with her. So she has a teacher coming to teach her French and all of her maids and everyone in the house sits in on these lessons. Everyone in her house learns French. Everyone in her house learns history. Huh. That education was just so incredibly important to her. So service to your society and education on a personal level yeah. were the most important ways that you show your value as a person. I can see how that got twisted into the musical My Fair Lady version. Right. Where, oh, this poor fish out of water, she needs a teacher. She needs somebody to help her catch up with everybody else. Exactly. And instead it was like, I would like to learn Russian. And I have the funds, so I'm going to... Exactly. I'm going to bring every teacher to me to teach me everything. Which, of course, was... It sounds extravagant, but that's how education happened, right? Yeah. So she... How cool. Was really, really dedicated to educating herself. She'd love to go to Europe and really immerse herself there. And she was very well accepted in Europe, which I think is another sign that she was not this country bumpkin. She was wildly popular in Paris. Oh. Country bumpkins don't do well in Paris. No. And then, of course, there's Titanic. Yes. Which is, I would guess, for everyone younger than us, what they know her from. You know, maybe our generation is the last one that grew up watching the musical. Yeah. And everyone younger than us only knows her from the movie. That's the most famous story. The, the Titanic legend slash lie. And, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the movie. Um, yes. So, first of all, tell us, tell us the legend. Tell us the story of Molly Brown on the Titanic. And then we can talk about what action. Margaret and Titanic. That is ugh, her real story. Most people know from the movie Titanic, mm-hmm. which came out 20 years ago. They see her as a Kathy Bates character, mm-hmm. as uneducated, new money, very brash. Um, and she really, I mean, she had an attitude towards her. She wasn't going to take any guff, but she was actually a very well-educated woman. And at that point, she wasn't considered new money anymore. She wasn't rejected by society. So how she's portrayed on Titanic wasn't entirely accurate. And Kathy Bates herself, I love Kathy Bates, and she did great with the script that she was given. But she is a bit too large of a woman, because mm-hmm. Margaret was always a very slender woman. But Hollywood just kind of takes her story and just runs with it. Um, there's a scene in Titanic, I always talk about this one, because they took it directly from the unsinkable Molly Brown where she's sitting at the dinner table and she's talking about JJ coming home and lighting a match in the stove and burning $30,000. That never happened. Oh, darn. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint everybody, but that never happened. So they basically took a lot of things from The Unsinkable Molly Brown, which was inaccurate in itself, mm-hmm. entertaining, but inaccurate, and made that uh, Molly Brown character in Titanic. She was never actually supposed to be on the ship. She was traveling in Europe and Egypt with her daughter, Helen, who is now grown, and JJ and Madeline Astor. We all know that name, Madeline and JJ. He had an affair with Madeline uh, while he was married to his first wife. Married Madeline, who was only 19, and he was in his 40s. Uh, They were escaping some gossip that was here in the States, and she was pregnant. Um, Little scandals there. 
So they were all traveling together. She received a telegram from her son, Larry. Her one and only grandson, who she never met at that point, Hmm. was very ill. So she had to take the first ship, which was leaving, which was Titanic. And so she went on with JJ and Madeline Astor. Her daughter, Helen, stayed behind for the spring social season. (laughs) Lucky, lucky girl. So everything went fine those first few days. And then that iceberg struck. Margaret was a world traveler. When it hit, she was in her bed. She was reading a book. She fell out of bed. Not really thinking too much of her safety at that point in time. She put on lots of clothes. She put $500 in her pocket. And this little statue is called a Yushapti. Um, In Egyptian culture, it's a helper in the afterlife. To her, it became a good luck charm. Uh, She went up on deck. Just like many other times in her life, she was helping people. She absolutely refuses to get in the lifeboats herself until two sailors literally pick her up and throw her into the boat. (laughs) Because she will not. And I'm sure they were irritated too because she's bossing them all around. She's furious that they're not putting enough people in the boats. There were only 24 people in her lifeboat. It had a capacity of 65. We all know that story, that how they were underfilled and more than half the people perished on Titanic. She had a little conflict with the officer that was in that lifeboat, (laughs) Officer Hitchens. She was very much, let's take control, let's start rowing ladies, where he's basically like, sit down, shut up. And she got to the point where, I'm going to throw you overboard if you don't knock it off. Basically, I'm paraphrasing her. (laughs) He also was refusing to allow the women to row because women can't row. Yeah. And she demanded that the women be allowed to row so that they could go back. And also because they were freezing. She said, we're going to freeze to death and we need exercise. So all of the women in the boat took turns rowing, which is probably why most of the women in the boat survived. Because a lot of people in the boats died because they were so cold. I didn't know that. they kept everybody warm by rowing. Very unladylike. But eventually the rescue ship Carpathia came along. She sprang into action and formed the Titanic Survivors Committee. A lot of the third-class passengers, they were immigrants. Right. So they didn't speak much English. And she speaks five languages. (laughs) So she immediately goes to work translating for all of these immigrants and getting telegrams sent to their people and making sure that they're going to be okay. She also realizes these people have nothing now, and I'm on a boat full of a bunch of rich people. So (laughs) she goes around to all of the wealthy people. They're really not in the mood for a fundraiser right now. (laughs) And she goes to all of these wealthy people, uh, the people on the Carpathia, but also the survivors of the Titanic, and starts insisting that they donate money to these third-class passengers. And nobody really wants to do it, and she will not have it. So she posts a list prominently throughout the boat of the people who have donated and how much they have donated. Oh my gosh. And publicly shames every wealthy person on this boat. And eventually everybody donates large amounts of money because they're totally embarrassed by this crazy Margaret Brown woman. And before the boat docks in New York, she has raised $10,000 for these third class passengers. (laughs) $10,000 in 1912. She's not a woman who sits down and feels sorry for herself. Right. Uh, when they got to New York City, she got another telegram from her son, all about her grandson. He was fine. Ugh. It turned out to be a milk allergy. Really? Yeah. So he was oh. going to be fine. But because she was a woman of action, she stayed in New York City, helped survivors get clothes on their backs, money in their pockets, places to go. She's just unstoppable. I mean, they call her unsinkable. She's unstoppable. When she knows that something is right, it will happen. <laughs> She did eventually become big in the New York City theater scene when she was older. Because right before she died, she moved to New York City to study acting. Really? Yes. How old was she when she did that? She, um, around 60. Wow. Yep. And she figured, when else am I going to get to do this? Like, she loved the Sarah Bernhardt style from France. So she moved to New York City. She lived in the Barbizon. She studied acting. She sang. And she even yodeled. (laughs) She studied yodeling in Switzerland. This woman there was nothing she didn't do. That's amazing. I love that. That's why I wish we had uh, recordings of her. Especially oh, yes. Yodeling. Oh, love yeah. Especially if she studied in Switzerland. To hear that. Right. Oh, it would have been. Yeah, oh, would have been not awesome. Record her. I think that's amazing detail. It seems like if you do that when you're 70, you're like, you're old and you're saying, you know what? The one dream I never followed, what I always wanted to do, I'm going to go and do it now. She described her life and who she was pretty perfectly in two different phrases. And these are from two different quotes. One was, I'm the daughter of adventure. And she goes where she needs when she's needed. So she that was her life philosophy. And I fully believe that's the best way to describe her. And towards the end of her life, she said she would rather snap out than fade out. Mm. And that 
once again, shows the kind of woman that she was who worked hard for those around her, but wanted to make sure that she lived a full life and was able to fulfill all of her dreams and fulfill all of her causes as well. So here's my question. Mm. Would we rather be known after our death, but for the wrong legacy or be forgotten? (laughs) And especially given her ambivalence about being well-known or being in the press. What would she have preferred? Yeah. If it's true that she avoided the spotlight, she didn't want to be seen at the forefront of all these movements, maybe she wouldn't have cared if everybody forgot what she did. Like, maybe her satisfaction would have been in the things that she established, the campaigns that she started, the people that she helped. And if we all forgot her name or misremembered her, maybe it, it doesn't matter. And that's what I thought. All the way through the interview... Until this moment. She was one of Denver's first historic preservationists. She helped save the Eugene Field House, which a lot of people don't know that name, but they may know the poem Wink and Blink and Nod. Oh, yeah. So he's the author of that. So that house was saved. How about that? So, you know, here I am in the Molly Brown house, hearing about her finding it worth her money and her time, when everything else in her life is really focused on alleviating personal suffering. But this she found really important to preserve this house. And so that throws a wrench in everything that I think about that. I'm not sure. And I do think she would be pleased Mm. to have her house preserved. And the story with Polly Pride using the media to further her ends makes me think that maybe she would also be totally fine being Molly Brown. Fine, call me Molly Brown if it will help people remember the important things that I did. If that helps them also do important things. Yeah. What's your answer? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think I think my answer depends on the scale of the misrepresentation, right? Like these seem like harmless myths. They weaken her power and they make her foolish, which irritates me. But they're not saying she was a Nazi, right? Uh-huh. And and I think I would be fine with variations that maybe change things but don't fundamentally misrepresent something that I hold important. And I'm not sure that we can what we can say about that with her because I think that several of her core values were completely erased. The fierce dedication to making the world better almost disappears. The story about the plucky young woman who fits in with society when that was the last thing on her mind. I think I I have no desire to be remembered at all. Hmm. If I'm remembered wrong, I don't care. Mostly I think I would just be happy to be forgotten entirely. And if I have some kind of strange legacy, and even if it's just mangled in the hands of folklore, I don't really care about that either. That's fascinating to me, because you're the history person, and you don't care. I don't care about the historical memory of the future. Wow. (laughs) Maybe because I know I have such a great appreciation for almost like a reverence for historical memory Mm -hmm. as a thing. But I also know that we rewrite history every few decades. Right. We will always keep retelling the story and tell it a different way. And to me, that's what makes it so great. That's what history is about. That's what makes it beautiful. And for some reason, I I have no need to be a part of that story. (laughs) I could just be forgotten. It could even bury me in an unmarked grave and have nobody ever remember (laughs) that or know that I ever existed. All right, I'm writing this down. (laughs) Yeah. There's something comforting about that. I will be forgotten. Hmm. Yeah, now that, that raises the question for me of like, what am I picturing when I picture that question? Who will I be remembered by? You know, I mean, that question is framed in terms of historical memory, societal memory. I don't have any anticipation of history remembering me. Yeah. Maybe your descendants, your great great yeah, grandchildren. I'm in terms of what do I want my family to remember about me? Mm-hmm. And that definitely matters to me. And that's really interesting because I think like we know about our ancestors. Right. But what has come down to us through the centuries right. is like one anecdote. Right. And in that one that's their anecdote, whole life. their whole life, that's all we know about them is this single event. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's it's kind of beautiful. The centuries filtered everything about them. Mm. And we got this one little nugget. I think I care about having my character known. 
I it might be then that there's like one little anecdote that which encapsulates your yeah. character. Yeah. Like I think, <laughs> you know, we have a great, great, I don't remember how many, grandmother who is known as Feisty Fanny. Mm-hmm. I love her and that is all I need to know about her. Yeah. The fact that she was known as Feisty Fanny. Exactly. She is my people. Yeah, exactly. Um, and <laughs> And so I think when I'm thinking like, what do I want to be known for? I think... I want to, I need a nickname. Quick. Someone. Yeah. yeah. Give me a nickname. Because if it conflicts with your core values, like right. four, four centuries in the future, you are known as Doormat Olivia. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would bother me. Yeah. Passive aggressive patty. You know, like. Yeah. Serious yeah. shushing spinster librarian. Yeah. Yeah, what if all they ever hear about me was that I was a librarian? Yeah. And then they oh. build your whole character around that. Right. Or all but librarians of the future are awesome, so it's going to be cool. Yeah, and you wouldn't know that. Yeah. In the future, librarians are like right up there with superheroes. They are the superheroes. And then they'll say, your great-great-great-grandmother was a librarian. They'll be like, <gasps> <gasps> cool. <laughs> and then so much will be mapped onto you. Yeah. Whether it, and you can't whether it actually you can't fits. do it. Yeah. What is your nickname? Encapsulate yourself in a single nickname. Oh, man. The pressure is too much. <laughs> Maybe that's why we need generations to do it. Right, we yeah, can't, she didn't call we, herself Feisty Fanny. Yeah, we can't see it clearly enough in Who the moment. Who named her Feisty Fanny? That's the alternate question. Yeah. If it's a different story if this is her husband. Yeah. Or if it's her neighbors. Yeah. Or if it's her religious authority. Exactly. Like, all of those are different. Was it an insult that right. stuck? Was she like 80 when they gave her that nickname? Right. Or was she eight? Yeah. So we recently found out, so we, what we think is two Romanov pieces in the house. We haven't had them authenticated yet, but through some research, we found the Romanov crest and we have a picture of Margaret with Princess Stephanie. Really? Yes. And I am fascinated by Romanov history. I'm more obsessed than I should be. So I've been (laughs) trying to dig more into this because we know that after um, the revolution, when the Romanovs were... Right. We know what happened to them. Uh, Princess Stephanie fled and she actually came to the States and Margaret welcomed her in New York, brought her out to the West. And what? Princess Stephanie actually went on the suffrage trail with Margaret. What? Um, but was denied entrance into the White House because she didn't have the right security clearance. So Margaret was allowed in, but Princess Stephanie was not. Wow. So, and we found another facet of her that I'm just like, what haven't you done yet, That's Margaret? That's amazing. Um, and the picture we have of the two of them, it's when they're older, but mm-hmm. it's one of the only pictures we have of Margaret smiling. Wow. So it, they just seem like old chums in that picture. Yeah. Um, after Titanic sank in 1912, that following winter, she actually hopped on a ship and spent the winter in Russia. Wow. If I was her, I wouldn't be getting on a ship again. As in the the Imperial Russian family. As yeah, the as Anastasia Tsar Nicholas the yep. Second, Anastasia Rasputin, that Romanov, that Romanov those family. family. <laughs> A member of that family came to Denver. To Denver to be with her. Yep. To hang out with Margaret Brown. Wow. And left her an umbrella stand. <laughs> <laughs> That's also really interesting that she is like our, she's the champion of the lower classes and the downtrodden. And yet, friends with the icon of aristocratic oppression. I mean, nobody was worse than Russia in the early 20th century. They were the epitome of aristocrats obliviously, blindly oppressing the downtrodden. And then the family is killed Only a few members of the whole of the Romanov family survived. There were like 46 of them, Mm -hmm. and like 26 of them or something were just brutally executed at home. But those who happened to be in the right place at the right time could escape. Mm. They are secreted Mm. off across the Black Sea or something like that. So to meet such a woman as she arrives in America and say, come with me, we'll do great things together. (laughs) Yeah, it's such a complicated story. And and yet I can also see, right, she she survived the Titanic. She, in many ways, is just serving the exact same role. These are survivors Mm. of a shipwreck of a country. Yeah, that's a good point. She speaks Russian. She can be the ambassador. She can be the one to rescue this 
refugee. Yeah. And make sure that she has a place to go. Hmm. Maybe she is the great champion of history's bedraggled losers. <laughs> whoever yeah. they are. Whoever washes up on the shore. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever is losing the battle. If you'd like to learn more about Margaret Brown, we have links on our website to books you can read. We've got photographs, resources, and a link to the Margaret Brown house. If you're ever in the Denver area, you can go and see it yourself. Music for this episode was provided by Andy Reiner and John Souza, the Earth String Band, Mark Nelson, and Killarney, who are Katie Davis Henderson and Colin Botts. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Smith. If you enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to leave a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It's the best way for us to reach more people. And if you'd like to help support more women's history and more episodes of this podcast, please visit our website at whatshernamepodcast.com and click donate. This episode was edited by Olivia Mickle, and What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson.